This video was recommended to me by a member of my Discord, and it's called Seven Skills Just Beginners Don't Spend Enough Time On uh, by Jens Larsen. Jens Larsen is, of course, probably the most famous jazz YouTuber, probably the best teacher on uh, YouTube for jazz anyway. A huge scope, huge range, very clear videos, always interesting, uh, great perspective. And I think he has helped, I don't know, thousands of people, 10,000 people to get started with jazz or stay inspired to learn jazz. I've never reacted to a Jens Larsen video before, but uh, I'm looking forward. The topic, seven skills jazz beginners don't spend enough time on, is a really great topic. I'm sure I'll agree on many points, but I, I'm sure I'll also disagree, but that's great because uh, the more viewpoints, the better. Before I start, I just want to say, I think it's important to say, if I disagree, that's just my opinion. And you know what they say about opinions, like everybody has one, but it doesn't have to mean anything. I might seem very confident about my opinions, but uh, I can surely be wrong. I expect to be wrong many times in the future, even today in this video. If you don't agree with me, let's talk about it, because uh, I'm prone to change my opinions when good arguments are presented. Let's uh, get started with the video. One of the biggest mistakes jazz beginners make is to practice a lot, but not develop the skills that really will get them further. In fact, a lot of practice is just wasting time and building bad habits. In this video, I want to go over seven skills that will help you become a better jazz guitar. You know, that is, of course, accurate. A lot of practicing that I've seen people do, I would call a waste of time. Not in the sense that you're not learning anything, but in the sense that the skill that you are learning is probably not directly translatable to the thing that you have to do tonight or, in, or next week or anytime soon, which is just probably be in a jam session and play a great solo on some tunes that you know. So that is already a good start and in my estimation, 100% correct. I even see it in a lot of camps that I teach at. I always teach a couple of jazz camps, gypsy jazz camps each year. And then when I see people practice in the hallways or in the common rooms, they're never using a metronome. They're always playing everything very fast, very sloppily. Um, they don't stick with something or they're practicing like finger style stuff, which is all great, but it doesn't help for the jam session that they are playing in that night. Okay, let's continue. Guitarist. Now some of these you might be working on already, but you can use this video to check so that you're sure nothing is missing. I actually think this one is easier to fix than most of the other skills in this video. And I'm sure that if I had recordings of myself from when I was starting out playing jazz, then I would definitely be guilty of playing long. Look at that editing. That editing is great. I wonder if he edits himself or he has an editor. I mean, he has such a big channel with almost 500,000 subscribers that I guess he has an editor. And uh, because it takes so long to get all these effects, I mean, it goes by very quickly. It's very appealing and attractive, but all his videos are like that. And I mean, that editing takes so long. I can do it. Now, I have done it a couple of times, but I'm not capable of doing that week after week. That's why I switched to live streaming because it's so much easier. Notes at the ending of phrases because I did not have this skill down yet. If you ask classical musicians who don't play guitar about their nickname for guitar, they will probably tell you Staccato Festival. Classical musicians are savages. What they mean is that the instrument has absolutely no sustain, which true. is sort of true if you compare it to a trumpet or a violin. Yes. But in this case, it's the other way around. Check this out. I'm sure you can hear how the long notes sound a bit strange and check. Yeah, he uses a quite a thick pick actually, I think. That's thicker than I use. And he's playing on a, a thin body, but the pick is really thick. It looks like at least two. So I play with a 1.5 uh, Delrin Dundle pick, which is for people that just start with Gypsy Jazz might be an odd thing because they think that you need a pick of three millimeters. But most, no, not most people, but I think this pick is the, the highest percentage of professional players use this pick. And I only switched to this pick a year ago. Uh, before that, I played with a... 1.8 Wegen pick, which is also a great pick, but I switched to this Dunlop Delwin and I really like the layer of control it gives you. But he uses quite a thick pick. Interesting. Check out how short notes are much better at conveying the rhythm and connecting with the groove. And this is, of course, quite important for jazz. <laughs> to 
control when you're using long or short notes is a problem that comes up very often with students. This is true, and uh, some people would call that phrasing, but I would call it articulation. And so when you play long and when you're playing short notes, and this is a very important thing in all styles of music. It's important in classical music, it's important in tango, it's really important in tango, and it's important in jazz. And he's right, of course, when you end the phrase, you, you want to end short. And that's actually where the name bebop came from. I think bebop was invented by a reviewer they went to see like Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie. Uh, he was trying to make a joke or he was trying to be insulting in the review because he didn't like it. He would say all those phrases, they end on bebop, bebop. <laughs> but you can hear in the word that it is short. And if you listen to great bebop players, you will hear that a lot of phrases end like that. And if you start doing ti da, you miss the, the rhythmic impulse of bebop students in my course the roadmap but they do learn to hear it and to fix it quite fast the first step is usually to just start to end phrases on short notes and sometimes getting used to hearing melodies that end on an offbeat also helps now, of course you want to play long notes sometimes as well the important thing is just that you are in control and that you choose it it shouldn't just be a habit let's move on to an on you know the funny thing is with violin this problem is even bigger because of course violins are very used to playing long notes, especially when you come from classical music. And they're also used to slurring a lot of notes, like four notes on the one bow. So here's where the guitar has a big advantage because there's many more impulses. So there's many more rhythmic precision in the lines. All those notes have an impulse. And on violin, if you start slurring, it starts sounding a little bit muddy with the string rhythm. And you really have to be even more firm as the teacher saying, okay, use less bow, make your bow shorter. It's even worse for violins. Line comment that really annoys me. I probably need to watch out that this doesn't end up as a rant about what learning music is really about. You can't handle the truth. Jazz is a style of music and it has its own repertoire. And a part of learning to play in that style is of course to learn to play those songs. So you want to get good. The title was, let me see again. He said, jazz is not a looping 251. That's funny because a lot of times jazz is actually a looping 251. If you look at a lot of the songs, it's, it's basically looping 251s, maybe in, in several keys, but I understand what he means. He means like you should not just loop a 251 over and over and play the same thing or just play on that progression. Although I have a slightly different opinion on that. Let's see what he says. But ironically, a lot of jazz tunes are kind of looping 251s. I'm trying to think of a tune that's very clear in a tune like uh, Coquette. It starts on one, but then it's like two, five, two, five, one. The bridge is two, five, one. And then it's a two, five with a long two and a long five. It's, it's all two, five, ones. About. You can't handle the truth. Jazz is a style of music and it has its own repertoire. And a part of learning to play in that style is, of course, to learn to play those songs. So you want to get good at learning songs and you want to learn a lot of songs. One of my favorite quotes is from the guitarist Peter Bernstein. Learn the song and let the song teach you. And for anything new that you want to learn, you haven't... Uh, yeah, I've heard Peter Bernstein say that as well. Actually, I did a workshop with Peter Bernstein in the pandemic. He was doing weekly or bi-weekly workshops through Zoom. And I went to the first one. It was the first time. So he was struggling with the tech, start with the Zoom and the, the sound. But the lesson was great. And he said uh, something similar to this, like you should learn just through, through tunes. Not so much just learn it out of the context of tunes. And I agree with that, but I have some more thoughts on it. But I want to see first what uh, Jens says. Really learned it until it's something that you can use when you're playing songs, when you're making music. You also want to keep in mind that all the Barry Harris solo masterclasses were about writing lines and songs. They were not about exercises. They were about making music. So you need to work on being able to learn songs, both from sheet music and by ear. Just... Learn a lot of songs so that music theory describes music that you already play, that you already hear. That way, you have music with diminished suspensions or altered chords. Okay, yes, but it's probably quite tricky to find many tunes like this. I mean, Spring is here, is famous for this opening, for these chords here, like A, a flat diminished, and then you get this. Not many tunes like that. I, the only the other tune I could think of is maybe uh, Set Up Our Starlight. But there's not many tunes. So yes, you will get tunes with uh, diminished suspensions and other stuff. But in my opinion, you will get mainly 251s. Doesn't mean you should start practicing 251s 
outside of the context of tunes, but I still think there's a lot of value in just practicing 2-5-1s in all keys. Of course, I have to say that because my uh, books also have these exercises and I made long backing tracks with looping 2 5 ones in all keys. But it's not meant to give you the whole perspective on jazz. It's just meant to make you play on the progression that occurs most in jazz tunes over and over again. It's like a drill. I read the book written by tennis coach of Agassi. Now I forgot his name, Brett, Brett something. I don't know, he wrote a book, I think it's called... The Zen of Tennis? No, it's not that book. But it's a book written about tennis through the eyes of the tennis coach of Agassi. And one thing that he says in the book is that when he gets a new player or he trains a new player, then Brad Gilbert, thank you, Brad Gilbert. Yes. So great to have a chat. There's always someone who knows. So Brad Gilbert writes that when he coaches people, then the first question he would ask them is like, describe your weakest shots and your strongest shots. And the answer he's looking for is if they would say, my strongest shots are my serve, and my uh, return. And then my weakest shots, uh, lob and uh, drop shot. If a player would say, yeah, my, my strongest shot is a drop shot, that means that he's, he's very good at a shot that you maybe play two times in a game. Maybe once, maybe you won't play the shot at all. So that means that you spend a lot of time working on something that is actually not very usable in a real match. A serve, if it's your service game, you have to serve every point. Return, every other game. So if those are your strongest uh, shots, you probably are a strong player. So it's important to do drills where you practice your serve or you practice your return in all variations with all adjusted parameters for different situations. And I think it's the same for jazz. You should be very good at playing on two five ones in all variations. So long two five ones where every chord lets a bar. Let's say we have a two five one to F, like G minus seven, C seven, one bar each. Right? F but also short ones where every chord is two beats. Maybe even where you play continuous, like A minor, D7, G minor, C7, F. Or those songs where you just keep looping two, five, two, five, two, five all the time. So all variations of two, five, ones. Two, five, ones where the two chord is a dominant. Yeah, you can uh, do that through tunes. You should do it through tunes, but it can't hurt to also practice it in isolation just because you are then covering a large part of what you have to do uh, during an actual jazz improv on many different tunes. But, you know, I understand the perspective of always sticking with tunes. I really understand the perspective, but I'm afraid that you would spend a lot of time here on learning how to play from A flat diminished to A flat six, even though it doesn't really occur that much. Now, if you want to know how to play on this, it's pretty easy. You just play G7 altered. <laughs> to A flat. There, I solved it for you. Just G7 alter, I mean, that's one option. You could also just play uh, A flat diminished skill. Or just A flat diminished pedios. You could play that major harmonic skill. Which one do you have to play? Uh, I never used it. I basically, for this tune or uh, for this progression, I would just play G7 altered or A flat diminished arpeggio. Maybe with lead tones, like... Something like that. Okay, let's move on. And then theory isn't theory, it's music. And that brings me to that type of comment that I find really annoying, and also to the dramatic camera. Because every now and again, I will get asked how to sound more modern or more dark or something else on a two... I don't have a dramatic camera, but I can zoom in like this. <laughs> Okay, that's just a zoom on the on the on the one camera that I use though. So you lose some uh, pixels. Two five one, and it becomes clear from the one asking the question that he or she is only playing this four bar loop. And I think that's really a pity. If you play a song, if you're trying to learn songs, then you have a progression with a story, development, twists and surprises, and you don't just work with a static four bar loop. And maybe wait a minute. Okay, now the two five one. Uh, yes, of course, you I could uh, circle all two five ones, but then circle the five and the next two, and that's not a two five one. But you would still mainly play on the two five one. So, for instance, in this tune, uh, there is one on roses. For me, the challenge here would actually not to play over the first two bars. You, well, you, you could practice that, but you probably are going to play on the E flat seven to D seven. Now, that is actually two five, 
but the two chord is a dominant chord and it's a tritone. So that's another variation of a two five, right? So you have E flat seven to D seven. You could view it as uh, a two five, like but there's several ways to to approach it. But you could also think B flat minor, but it, it's kind of a two five. And then what else is there? Uh, G minor, not a two five one. Well, it's a backdoor two five. So B flat minor E flat seven to A minor seven would be the same as E flat seven to F, because A minor 7 is the third degree, and that's in the key of F, that's basically just F. So that is actually a 2 5 1. It's a backdoor 2 5 1. It's another variant of a 2 5 1, but it is one. Uh, A minor, A minor 7, D minor 7, G minor 7. Yes, but A minor 7 is the third degree. D minor 7 is the sixth degree, so that's just one. So again, if you circle the one to the next two, you would always get this, but. After that, <laughs> it's a 2 5 one G minus 7, C7. So I understand this graphic is to make a point, but actually it doesn't really convince me. It's still all 2 5 ones. Different variations of it, but it's still 2 5 ones. Just work with a static 4-bar loop. Okay, what else there? D minor G7, G minor C7. That is actually a 2 5 one It's again, it's a 2 5 one with the two chord being a dominant, G7, and then going to C7. And Within that 2-5 is another 2-5-1, G minor C7. And then uh, let's go to the final one. G minor 7 to B flat minor 7. Well, that's the same. We, again, if you make certain circles, you will always find, even if I make a backhand trick with only looping 2 5 ones, I could draw circles around a lot of not 2 5 ones by connecting the one to the next two. I made the point three times already, but that's basically what's happening here. I understand the point. I'm, I don't disagree, but uh, this... Graphic, we get a little bit cheated, a little bit. Maybe it's because you're playing that static four bar loop that your solo gets boring so quickly. But enough complaining for now. This could actually also be a hot take or at least a delicate topic, even though I'm not gonna go to the dramatic camera for this one. But I think you can argue that jazz has a certain language in the melodies that we improvise in terms of rhythm, flow, phrasing. Oh, what was the main so point? Let's see. Uh, I think it was the main solo point. Right? gets boring so quickly. But enough complaining. For now, this could actually also be a hot take. Learning the language, okay. Or at least a delicate topic, even though I'm not going to go to the dramatic camera for this one. But I think you can argue that jazz has a certain language in the melodies that we improvise in terms of rhythm, flow, phrasing, and actually to some degree also just what melodies are used. And this is probably true for most style of music. We can yeah, all let's hear look at the list. Let's look at the list again. Rhythm, flow, phrasing, and. Rhythm, flow, phrasing. Actually, to some degree. Rhythm, I understand. I, I think I understand. I mean, it, that could both mean timing or it could be what kind of rhythms you use in your solo. Flow is... I would define flow in just as how good your continuous eighth note lines are. Like, are you able to play continuous eighth note lines? Let's say you play a solo on... Um, Hans of Rose, we just played. You should be able to play a solo like. So it's, it's kind of continuous eighth notes. That means that you can flow over those changes and then you, you could, of course, choose to not do that all the time, but you should be able to do that. If you can do that, then you probably won't have any problems with flow. I'm not sure that he means that by it, uh, but I'm trying to find like clear parameters or clear definitions, like phrasing. So phrasing for me is a problematic word. I hear it all the time, also in the university where I teach. But phrasing, for me, phrasing just means what it means in classical music. So it means, uh, for instance, for like a woodwind instruments where they breathe, because they need to breathe between phrases. It's like, oh, you have a, you start here, the phrase starts here, and there it ends, so you can take a breath there. That's what I would call phrases. So you have a start and an ending to a certain phrase. But in jazz, a lot of people use it for like articulation or timing. It, it has so many meanings. So I wonder what is meant by phrasing here. Let's, let's see if he explains. He also just what melodies are used. And this is probably true for most style of music. We can all hear when something is a blues lick. So we don't really get an explanation of those parameters. 
And if you want to learn to play jazz, then you need to check out vocabulary so that you get that sound into your playing. Now this can be checking out licks, exercises, or what is probably the fastest way to improve, learning solos by ear, something I've talked about in numerous videos. A bonus if you play along with solos that you've learned by ear is that you also improve your phrasing, timing, and swing feel. Okay, phrasing, timing, and swing feel. Okay, so timing and swing feel, I would, I would say that's same. for me. That's I use them uh, interchangeably. So that's that's the problem with all these kind of extract terminology. Different people use it in different ways. So for me, timing and swing feel are, are similar when it's a swing tune. Of course, it's, if it's straight, then timing would be for me the same as the straight eighth note. It's, it's just where you play the eighth notes compared to the quarter note in the rhythm section. If I would be very precise. Timing for me would be where you play your eighth notes, whatever style it is, uh, it could be swing, it could be straight, on the quarter note that's implied by the rhythm section. Now you could say, oh, well, how about triplets? How about sixteenth? Yes, that's also part of timing, of course. But it starts with those eighth notes. Why? Because 80% of what the things you're gonna play normally are eighth notes. If you look at the jazz solo, it's mostly eighth notes and, and rests. And then there are some triplets and 16th, but it's not the most common rhythm. So for me, timing and swing feel is the same thing in a sense. Phrasing, we have that word again. I'm not sure how you improve your phrasing by playing along with the solo. The phrases are already made by the soloist that you're playing along with. Though so maybe you could study his phrasing, but you could then also study the phrasing from just reading the solo if you've written it down, but you don't have to play along with it. So I'm not sure how your phrasing can improve by playing along, but that is if you use my definition of phrasing. He probably has a different definition of phrasing. I could maybe take a guess, maybe it's also hammer-ons, pull-offs, uh, but I call that more like technique or articulation. But yeah, that's just different uses of those words. Learning the solo by ear is great. I've done that many times. When I started the YouTube channel, basically I started writing everything down, but I also did it a little bit before. I just like writing it down. I'm also good at writing things down. That's another part of it. For me, it's very easy to write things down, so I just do it that way. But then when I learn the solo, I don't only use the tab I created. I use that to jog my memory, to learn the phrases maybe if I forget it, but I mainly use the recording to learn the solo and I play along with the recording. But I don't mind writing it down. As long as you don't take it as an alternative to the original recording, you should still use the recording to play along with, to listen for the articulation, to listen for the, the swing feel or the timing, for the dynamics. Which, of course, is also a part of the language. Maybe he means accents with phrasing? Yeah, so for me, that is still articulation. But if you target notes, if you do kind of Charlie Parker thing, you know? Target notes, for me, that's still part of articulation. Also in classical music, even though I don't like refer to classical music when we refer to jazz, that is part of articulation, it's, it's this little accent. So maybe I'm too, I use too much of the classical terminology, which I actually made a video that I don't like it, but in my head it's like that, like articulation and phrasing are two distinctly different things. Language. Now that I'm already on the topic of timing, swing feel, hearing the groove and the harmony, then this is for all stuff that you want to develop. And one thing that will help you doing that is being able to practice with a metronome. Vastly underrated and actually a lot more fun than you might think once you get used to it. For jazz, this is about playing with the metronome on two and four and learn to play songs and soloing. And that is, by the way, a very good metronome, which I had for a long time. And my violin teacher had the same one. And this, I mean, the, the click on that metronome is great. They should have that click on, <laughs> on the metronome app. Then I would use that. but. Uh, of course, he's making good points. You should always practice with metronome. Apart from using it to practice your your timing, it's also just good to, to force yourself to practice things slowly. Because if you put the metronome at tempo 100, you have just something that tells you to keep playing slowly. Because a lot of the times, uh, even me, you start thinking, okay, I can do it, let's play it faster. And you didn't really fix all the problems with the phrase yet or you still didn't figure out the exact fingerings or picking directions that you want to use or hammer-ons. And then you go up in tempo before you were actually meant to do that. And if you had taken a metronome and you put it at tempo 100 and um, 
say I'm going to do a practice session at Tempo 100 for the next 10 minutes, you probably can solve all of those problems. Like that. And this will boost your ability to keep time, feel time, hear the harmony and play in the groove. The difference between practicing with a metronome and a backing track is that it's much more difficult to play with a metronome. But if it swings, then it's you. When you play with a backing track, then if it swings, it might just be the backing track. I understand this point. I understand what he's saying, but there is one thing that you don't learn from a metronome, and it's a very important thing that you actually need in a real life playing situation. It, it is your ability to find the quarter note in the band. Now, if you have a metronome, uh, it's too bad my battery died, but I can just use, use my phone. So this is let's say this is one. And let's do it. Let's say it's one and three. It's kind of weird, but let's do one, two, three, four. Yeah. There is some sadness in finding the quarter note because there's two empty spaces. So I still need to find in my head, tuck, 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 one, two, three, four. But once I have it, it will, be, it will stay very stationary. And there's only one source that I have to listen to to get the four beats. Now, if it's two and four, two, four, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's a little bit more difficult to find the one and the three. But once you got it, you probably have it. Doesn't mean that you will be able to play with it perfectly. I'm just talking about finding the quarter note. Now, if you have a whole band with a drummer, let's say a Hammond organ or something, or a bass and a piano player, it's more difficult to find that quarter note. A lot of stuff might happen. Right? The bass might play in two or might play in four or might sometimes play in two, sometimes in four. The drummer might have a hi-hat that goes into a four or it's, it's a drummer that has this free hi-hat thing. Uh, the, the, the piano player might be stabbing chords on the one end. and So you can get distracted by that. And some people that have great time with the metronome actually don't have it with the band because they're not used to finding the quarter note pulse. And there's a lot of uh, backing tracks on YouTube that are pretty bad, but they're good to practice with because you still need to be able to find that quarter note that ties everything together. And um, there are some backing tracks, and I'm, of course I'm not going to mention them, but there are some backing tracks that sound really good, but if you listen very closely to the bass and the drums, they're not very much together. And if you start only focusing on the bass, you will sound off. So you actually have to listen to the right on that track to really lock in. So that's the one thing you don't really learn from a metronome, is to find that quarter note in a more busy environment. So for that, a backing track is actually good. If you look at how famous jazz guitars practice, then it's pretty much always with a metronome. There are almost no exceptions there. And if you want to get started practicing with the metronome on two and four, then you can... You see the Scovet was practicing with the metronome on all four clicks, by the way. It was not two and four. Check out this video that I made a few years ago that covers that topic. I'll link to it in the description. What I, I want to say something about the two and four metronome. I always say that too. I demonstrate it in workshops. I play solo on the tune in two and four. Uh, sometimes I try to do it with a metronome on two ends, and I, I always fail with doing that. Sometimes I can do it at home, but never in a live situation. But I used to think that if you had good timing, you could automatically do that. But I actually discovered this is not the case. I'm not going to mention names, but I tried this exercise with some very famous gypsy chess players that have great timing, right? So they have world-class timing, and they couldn't do it with two or four, and... The reason why they couldn't do it was because they were not used to have an impulse on only beat two and four, because they're used to playing with a rhythm guitar doing. Right, the rhythm guitar is not doing. So that's another thing about this two and four thing that is a little bit um, odd. I, this is not the impulse that you actually get behind you when you play in a band. Like a bass player would never play on two and four. In fact, you would you would fire the bass player if he would only be playing on two and four. The bass player would actually be playing on one and three, or one, two, three, four. So if you look at it like that, you might have an argument there that is more important that you can play with a metronome on one and three. And I wasn't really sure about this, but now that I did this test with a couple of Gypsy Jazz players with excellent timing that could do it with no problem with the metronome 1 and 3, I'm starting to think that it is more important that you can do it with the metronome 1 and 3 than it is on 2 and 4. 2 and 4 is just a fun activity. It's to, to test yourself, to feel your internal rhythm. 
but it's more important that you can do it with the metronome on one and three because that better resembles a real life situation. Compared to running a marathon, there is this training activity where you put weights right, in your pockets or something and you run with stones. And um, the theory is that if you do that, then if you take them out of your pocket, you will feel light like a feather and then you'll be able to run longer. It is probably true. Well, I mean, this is true. I've, I've tried that. But I think in the end, to really win a marathon, it's much more important to work on the skills that you would actually need during the marathon, which is probably good technique and uh, good movement. I don't know what it takes. But I bet if you talk to a, a trainer and you ask him for the top five activities, running with stones might not be in it. I'm not sure. I, we, could, we could check that. But I, I compare it to that. Um, everybody always talks about playing with the metronome on two and four, but maybe one and three is more important. Maybe. I'm not sure about this, but I'm starting to believe it. And since there are some players that cannot do in two and four, but have great timing, that proves that, that there is no definite correlation between good timing and being able to play on two and four. Let's not even talk about even more difficult exercises. I said about soloing is just as important for chords. So instead of just playing tons of inversions or other exercises on two by one progressions, you also need to work on putting those chord voicings to work on songs. And trust me, that will help you develop so much in terms of voice leading, adding melodies and colors to your chords and all that other stuff that like me, you probably love about jazz and jazz chords. You can start the process what is with that that alterations so voice it. leading, adding melodies and colors. Voice leading, melody, color, fills, extensions, alterations. M maybe it's um, a typo. I always thought it was alterations. Ah, look it up. I've never seen these words, but it could could be a typo. But uh, maybe it's maybe I was saying it wrong all the time. Alteration, alterations. Sounds weird though. I don't. Know. To your chords and all that other stuff that, like me, you probably love about jazz and jazz chords. You can start the process rubato and explore the harmony and then later move it into time. Now, of course, rhythm is also important here, but I'll get to that in a bit. A problem that I've also encountered myself quite often when I'm trying to... Yeah, so for a gypsy jazz player, there's not so much chord melody, but I do agree with uh, fine voicings that work on a gypsy jazz guitar. So for a lot of stuff that works really great on an art stop, doesn't really work on a gypsy jazz guitar, uh, especially when you play with a very loud rhythm guitar, right? Like uh, if somebody plays like rhythm like this, you don't want to do it. You, know, you don't want to be doing that stuff because nobody will hear it. You have to do something like... Uh, you want to work on that kind of uh, language in your chords. So um, find something that is suited for your work practice. I would never do the exercise that he was doing, like playing very soft chords. I mean, I, it's, it's fun to do, don't get me wrong, but uh, I would be, never be able to use it because it just doesn't work in gypsy jazz, which is what I play mostly, of course. But I do agree with finding chord shapes that actually work instead of learning all possible inversions, which I've seen a lot of teachers recommend. I take a skill and use all inversions, but how many of those inversions are you really gonna use? Like when I teach somebody chords, I show them some really cool formulas. I, I, I tell them like, if you want to play A7 and you want to sound like Django, just use these two chords. Like, just it's one voicing. You can do so much with those two voicings. When you play um, coquette. <laughs> you know, so, I would teach them a couple of those tricks and then make them um, improvise with only like three chord formulas. And then I never talk about any versions or other ways. I just say, play those two things. Like uh, another really cool thing you can do with this voicing. So when you have a two, five, one, you could, in a ballad, for instance, let's say you have a ballad and it is uh, D minor seven and then G seven to C, right? The Django does something like this. A 
beautiful, right? It's, it's just this, this, this augmented voicing that he shifts down and then just resolves to a uh, triad. So I would just show them a couple of those tricks and then uh, let's work on that. Just, just do this voicing. Okay, let's go on. Analyze new material, like for example, a new way of playing an arpeggio or a chromatic enclosure, is that I know how to play it, but it doesn't really work when I use it in a solo. And that's because an important step is missing between practicing something as a technical exercise and then turning it into great lines in a solo. And that missing step is composing. You can use lines or even entire solos. Again, also something that I help students with in the roadmap quite frequently. Composing is actually just improvising slowly and also with a way to go back and fix the lines so that they sound better and yeah. that you can figure out how... Yeah, writing your own lines is um, a great tool that has been used for decades. You know, I never do it. <laughs> That's my... Um, my my flaw maybe but the thing is that i do it i do it automatically what i mean is like i've learned so many phrases great phrases that i start combining them automatically and that's my way so i never sit down and write a new phrase i just come up with them on the spot because i've i've learned so many licks that i just see them in combinations and sometimes i play something that doesn't really sound nice and i just remember not to do that again and then sometimes I find a combination that's great and I try to remember it. But a faster way is probably to sit down and come up with new phrases. The disadvantage though is that you might come up with some phrases that are not very tasteful because you don't have the, you didn't develop the musicality or taste yet to come up with phrases that are actually great. That, that's the disadvantage. And I've seen that many times, people playing some really weird stuff, like Jens said, like, doesn't really fit in the vocabulary or the language of the style we're playing. And it sounds very contrived or made up, but it, that's because it actually was made up without using, let's say, good sounding fundamentals. Uh, I never have this problem because all the phrases I play are good phrases because I describe them from great players. And the combinations are also great because it's just a combination of a couple of great phrases. A new thing should fit in there. This is a very effective way to introduce new material into your vocabulary. And keep in mind that this is also how Barry Harris works in his solo master classes. So if it works for him, it could probably make a useful part of your practice as well. The worst okay, way let's to say, think let's about, say about Barry Harris. Wait. Keep in mind that this is also how so that they sound better and that you can figure out how the new thing should fit in there. This is a very effective way to introduce new material into your vocabulary. And keep in mind that this is also how Barry Harris works in his solo master classes. So if it works for him, it could probably make a useful part of your practice as well. So he's saying Barry Harris was making phrases up on the spot and then everybody had to copy it. But, you know, Barry Harris has such a rich knowledge of bebop and a rich vocabulary that every phrase he comes up with is probably great. But notice that the other people that are just copying that phrase, they were not coming up with their own phrases because probably their phrases wouldn't be as good as Barry Harris's. That's my point a little bit. Like if you take phrases from masters in the style, you are sure to get good phrases. Sometimes there could be a phrase that you don't even like, but you just have to learn to like it. You have to, to study the phrase and see why it's great and you start getting used to it and then you find a way to use it and to play it. So that's what I mean. Like, it's dangerous to come up with your own phrases if you don't have the background to come up with something that sounds uh, good among other good things. The worst way to think about the course of a song is as a chord symbol with some extensions. This should almost be in the dramatic angle, eh? Simply because that's not music. What you want to work on is opening up those chord symbols so that you can improvise and connect the whole thing. You want to turn the chords into music. And for many jazz beginners, comping rhythms are a mystery and something that's very difficult to improve on. But that is maybe more about how we think about comping than the rhythms themselves. I am kind of curious about this. So I think he's talking here about voice leading where you have moving notes on top. That is something that is probably mainly used in like contemporary jazz. Although when, when I listen to like Peter Bernstein, does he do that a lot? Like Peter Bernstein would, like let's say it's a 2 5 to C, he would do something like. 
what he would do was like he would play one, two, one, two, three, four. So there is moving top notes, but it's all different forcings. I've described a lot of Peter Burns' scene, so it's something like else he would do is for E7. Notice these are all different voicings. He's not doing right. He does. He's not keeping the same bottom notes. They all change. What else? It's not a Peter Burns' thing. So this is two five to two D. He plays. Notice there is a clear voice leading there, but it's all different chords. So I think it's a certain style where you just take, where you move one one note. But uh, in Gypsy Jazz, this is rarely happens, so I've never practiced that, but might be a good thing to practice. I'm trying to think of guitar players that do that a lot. I, I transcribe a lot of Peter Bernstein. I've transcribed some Pasquale Grasso. I'm not the greatest fan of Pasquale's comping in the sense that it doesn't really fit in Gypsy Jazz because it's too low. Uh, it's great for uh, bebop, of course, because you stay out of the way of the solo player. Maybe he does that. I have to listen more. Um, I'm thinking about other guitar players that I've described a lot. Martijn van Eterson doesn't really do that also. But I, I think it's a certain style. I know I've heard that before, but uh, it's not something that I worked on. But it's probably a good thing to work on. Can you let me know in the comments, when was the last time that you practiced comping a song with the metronome on 214? Because... That is actually what you need to be doing. When you comp on a stop. Okay, that's interesting. I've heard that before. I've said that before. But, you know, in, in the light of what I just said, like that's not a very um, good simulation of what happens in real life. Right? If, <laughs> if I start comping and the bass player starts playing two and four, man, that's going to be a disaster because the solo player will get so confused. Because if you start comping, let's say, in like a bebop style or modern jazz style where there's no rhythm guitar, and I start, let's say, this is the bass... So let's say we play rhythm changes, right? One, two, one, two, three, four. I mean, yeah, it's difficult to imagine because you hear this metronome and it's a two or four, but if that would be bass, bass notes, the solo player wouldn't know what to do. So. Aren't you training yourself for a situation that never occurs? Wouldn't you learn more if you practice with a metronome on more than three? That's something I'm just thinking of now. Also based on those tests I've done. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to test it. Because I've practiced a lot with the metronome on two and four. And I always advise it. But maybe the coming months, I'm just going to only practice with the metronome on one and three just to, uh, to see what happens. I'm gonna test it and I will let you know what the result is. Um, then you can start thinking in phrases, work with call response, riffs, and become much more free to get the song to sound good. And you're not getting stuck with which rhythm or which extension to play. To be able to play chords and phrases and put them to use on songs, then you don't want to be stuck with two complicated chords that are not flexible. And Joe Pass has a really solid approach for building a chord vocabulary like that. Joe Pass, talk about yes. In this video. Joe Pass, man, Joe Pass, if you look at the chords of Joe Pass, that's great. Maybe Joe Pass is somebody who does that. I have to look into it. I didn't transcribe a lot of Joe Pass. Maybe I should do more. But it could be that Joe Pass is doing that moving top note a lot. Very interesting. Of course, Joe Pass played a lot with his fingers. These kinds of things might also be easier to do with your fingers. If I always play with a pick and... Uh, Peter Burstein also plays a lot with his pick, his comping. Uh, maybe if you play with the pick, it's less effective or something. I don't know. I don't know. I have to think about that. Okay, so uh, great video, of course, by Jens. Uh, I'd say uh, go check it out. There's a link in the description. Give him a like, subscribe, although he doesn't need uh, me to tell that you to subscribe because you're probably already subscribed if you watch uh, my channel. <laughs> so instead, subscribe to me. Uh, but uh, thanks, Jens, for this video, and maybe uh, I'll check out some more of his videos in the future. Of course, I've checked out many of his videos in the past, but I've never reacted to one.